Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes, thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. Words taken from the gospel for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the early 14th century, lived a little saint in the town of Castello, Italy. Blessed Margaret was born of wealthy and noble parents, but she herself was blind and severely deformed, having a hunchback and one limb much shorter than the other. If you want a good cry, read her life. It's amazing. Out of pride and shame, the parents hid her for 20 years in some of the most inhumane ways. Their patience at an end, they finally sought a miraculous cure for little Margaret at a nearby shrine in Costello. When the miracle was not forthcoming, they abandoned her. At the age of 20 years old, blind, crippled, friendless, but she had a friend. She had the divine friend. From her earliest years, she grew up next to the altar of God. During the last years of her life, she revealed to her confessor that whenever she attended Holy Mass, she could see Christ our Lord, Christ incarnate, upon the altar. Her confessor sought to give this statement a a spiritual meaning. Do you mean, Margaret, that you are conscious of some special way of the divine presence? No, replied Margaret. That is not what I mean. I see our Lord. But how is that possible, he asked, when you are blind? I do not know, was the unperturbed reply. The confessor was silent for a moment, pondering her statement. Then he said, Margaret, do you see the crucifix, the missal, the candles on the altar? No, Father, I do not. Do you see the priest or the altar itself? No, Father, I do not. There you have it. There you are, he exclaimed triumphantly. You do not actually see our dear Savior. Apparently, in some way, you sense his presence. This I can readily understand and believe. Margaret remained silent. Is it my explanation correct, Margaret? Father, she replied with the utmost tranquility, you have commanded me to reveal to you in confession the innermost secrets of my heart. Since I am obliged to speak, I must repeat what I have said before. From the consecration until the communion, I do not see the priest, the crucifix, the missal, or anything else. But I do see Christ the Lord. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God, says the Lord. They always know the time of His Majesty's visitation And what is for their peace? To be a Christian essentially means we are to be another Christ. The more we conform to him, the better Christians we will be. The more holy, the more at peace we will be. And the more peace we can bring to this veil of tears. We possess a way in this traditional Latin Mass to conform ourselves most closely and intimately to his majesty. And as this is an amazing, amazing recapitulation, a summary, a reliving of his very life. And that is when we attend mass, we are seeing Christ and we're reliving his life. Wow. Wow. And what is more, not only is this recapitulation done symbolically, but after the consecration until the communion of the priest, it is in real time. Just as blind Margaret of Costello indicated, it makes present again in time and space His Majesty's perfect sacrifice of Calvary. 
Thus, as authentic Christians, we are to conform to Christ in the Mass. We are to conform to the Mass. We are not to make it conform to us. This has been given to us to, so that we can become true and authentic Christians. We are to conform to it. Extremely important point for our time. So this deserves some closer examination and explanations. So let's begin in the sacristy. The priest, who is Christ's vicar at the Mass, the altar Christus, ordained to be such, starts, as it were, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. That's what the sacristy is. He's vesting with the priestly vestments of Christ so they can die on the cross for us. Thus, each part of his vestments relate to something of Calvary. The amis is the blindfold, the alb, the seamless garment, the cincture. He was scourged and bound with ropes. He stole of the priest. Christ was led away, led away like a slave. The manipole that he held up his arms on the cross for us would not let them down. The chasuble, Herod's garment, the one the soldiers divided into four parts. Each of these have a cross upon them as a reminder that every Mass takes us back to Good Friday. Next, we recall that St. John the Baptist preceded our Lord and preached repentance to prepare for his coming. Thus, to prepare for the coming of Christ at Mass, we pray the prayers at the foot of the cross, the foot of the altar, begging the Lord for mercy. Confiteor, you heard earlier. Mea culpa, mea culpa. Then there's the entroyet, the first word spoken from the altar, with the sign of the cross being made in silence. This is the Annunciation and Incarnation made possible by the silent and mysterious work of the Most Holy Trinity. Christ is born at the Gloria in Excelsis Deo, with the angels singing the Gloria. If you're ever wondering what to do at Holy Mass, return to the Gloria. It contains the four basic purposes of the Mass, namely laudes, gratiae, preces, et oblatio giving God praise and adoration, thanksgiving, petition, and offering him expiation, atonement, or sacrifice. That's why we're here. And it's indicated by the name, the sacrifice, atonement, by the naming of our Lord as the Lamb of God. Thus, he is the Lamb that comes out of the virginal womb and receives our prayers at the collect, this is the presentation in the temple with Simeon, the priest, offering up the Christ Jesus, the child Jesus. Notice that as we make our way to Calvary, the priest holds up his hands when praying to indicate that these prayers will only be answered through the crucifixion, through a connection to the cross. Whenever Moses prayed for big things in the Exodus, he had to have a, the wooden staff and his arms apart. Having come out of the womb, Christ now enters his public life of preaching and working miracles. Thus we have the lesson, and we have the gospel. The people sit on the grass, the pews, for the Sermon on the Mount, which is what we're doing right now. Then the faithful respond to the sermon by professing their faith in the creed through the priest professing it. We profess, the choir sings it. Hopefully, whatever the priest says from the pulpit, and this is a very important point for our time, because it's very much neglected. Hopefully, whatever the priest says from the pulpit coincides with the creed. That it's really, truly part of the faith. And if it's not, he will be held responsible for that. In a sense, a priest takes his life when he's in the pulpit. Takes his life in his hands. You speak, you're speaking for Christ. Be careful. 
We then go to the Last Supper at the Offertory. This is done in silence so that we can form our intentions and place ourselves, our loved ones, our concerns on the paten and in the chalice and ask for transformation. Maybe we could pray that little prayer, Lord, transform me into thee as thou wilt transform this bread and wine into thee, into thy body and blood. This is one of the very reasons why the Mass is a recapitulation a summing up of the life of Christ so that we will be transformed by being exposed to it. We will be transformed into him to be another Christ. Notice the wording of the prayers here indicate, that is the prayers of the offertory, indicate that the sacrifice of Christ is somehow already present. One reason for this is that the last supper was real. So the offertory is the last supper. And it was real. It really was a sacrifice. It was the first Mass. He laid down his life in an unbloody manner in that first Mass. At the double consecration, the night before, the Jews and the Romans took his life away on Calvary. Thus, no matter how much they tried the next day, they could not do anything to his majesty that he had not already done to himself. In the upper room. He was already laid down his life. He'd already slain. Would that we could give ourselves so completely at the mass that no power on earth could overcome us. No fear of pain or death. No one on earth or under the earth could do anything to us that we have not already done to ourselves in the mass. Wow, that's heavy, powerful, active participation in the Mass. There's hardly any higher level. After the supper was over, His Majesty sang a hymn of praise before going out into the Garden of Olives. Thus we have the preface, we have the sanctus after which we fall down kneeling in the Garden of Olives at the start of the canon. This is the time to beg graces to be showered down upon the church, especially upon her leaders that are mentioned by name, and on all of our loved ones that we preserve, that we persevere in faith and charity, and that we be numbered among the elect. St. John the Baptist comes back here to alert us that the Lamb of God is nigh. We hear John's voice in the bells ringing at the epiclesis shortly before the consecration. The time of our visitation has arrived, he is saying. The manner in which the crucifixion is now represented, made present again, is by the separate consecrations of the bread and the wine. The bread is transubstantiated to become the body of Christ and the wine, his precious blood. They are consecrated separately. This shows us the presence of a sacrifice, the sacrifice, in which the separation of body and blood has happened. Again, St. John is heard in the bell saying, Behold the Lamb of God at the elevation. Here he is. Peace is possible through his blood. With a double consecration, we finally arrive at Calvary. This is in real time, no longer in symbol form. Again, this is why the priest's hands are always held up and apart when praying. At the second consecration, two windows are now open. One to Calvary and one to heaven. At this point in the Mass, we are indeed with our faith, our sacramental character, entering into the kingdom of heaven. But it is also Jesus Christ set forth before our very eyes as crucified, as St. Paul mentioned in Galatians. Recall that this is the very time that the blind from birth, blessed Margaret of Costello, could see our Lord. The windows were open. And this is a deep mystery. 
indicated by the words Mysterium Fidei, in the consecration of the chalice. These two windows are not side by side. They're in a row, one behind the other. With the window to Calvary opening up in the front and the window to heaven behind. Thus, heaven's light and glory silhouette Calvary, as it were, showing us this is how to enter here. You want to go to heaven? There is no other way. You must be crucified and die with Christ. You must become another Christ. You must be recognized by God the Father as a Christ if you are to enter here. The only way is through Calvary. This also means that all grace is flowing down from heaven to draw us up to Christ and Him crucified are in the shape of a cross. And when they hit us, they make us conform to Christ and Him crucified. If we have ears of faith, we can hear our blessed Lord cry out from the wood of the cross, I thirst. I thirst for souls, He is saying. Say back, I thirst for Thee, O Lord. Help me. He said when he's lifted up, he'll draw all things to himself. Say to him, Lord, I am something. Draw me to thee. And what about those words that we all need to hear and say ourselves? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. At the second consecration, say something like, Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, the blood, the soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fill in the blank. For. For the poor and holy souls in purgatory. For my spouse. For my parish. For the Pope. For conversion of sinners. Here, all the motion is up. It's ascending. Our Lady Corredentrix is right there to help us and make it possible. This is the time to adore, to thank God for graces received, to offer the Lamb of God for sinners. Time to make acts of faith, hope, and charity. Here we are in touch with that unspeakable groaning of Christ on the cross, and we're in touch with it by the power of the Holy Ghost, mentioned by St. Paul in Romans. Time to seek to have the permissions of the devil removed, which we spoke of last Sunday. Here now, peace is possible because it comes through the blood of the cross. At this moment, the priest is face to face with God, a fearful thing indeed. And thus he looks as much as possible upon the host lying on the corporal to keep this in mind, to keep vigil as our Lord commanded in the gospel. After the paternoster, the sacred host is broken at the fraxio to show that the Christ is indeed the lamb that was slain. Our Lord has died. But then almost immediately a particle of the host is placed in the chalice as the priest says, Pax Domini, sit semper vobiscum. The peace of Christ be with you always. This is the resurrection without which there is no true peace. By placing the particle in the chalice, the reunification of the body and blood of Christ is symbolized. The lamb that was slain is now alive. Now we can say, Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Now to complete a Holocaust sacrifice, the victim needs to be destroyed. Thus, to complete the sacrifice of the cross begun at the double consecration, the priest must consume the species, both of them. Once he consumes the precious blood from the chalice, the windows to Calvary and heaven close. Again, this is why blessed Margaret of Castello saw his majesty from the consecration to the communion of the priest. Note that after receiving the host, the priest has a unique moment to pray in union with Christ on the cross in real time because the chalice has not yet been emptied. Thus, the rubrics of the Mass tell him to pause and meditate here before completing the sacrifice. No wonder the priest faces the altar. Why divine intimacy? 
It's one of the main reasons that I will always offer this Mass and no other. Divine intimacy. The priest needs this if he is going to survive the difficulties of life as a priest in our modern world. Think of those old-time pictures of the priest at Mass with His Majesty on the cross coming down and the priest and our Lord are together. When our Lord ascended into heaven, He commanded the apostles to go out into all the world, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Thus the priest commands, Ite Misa Es, go, that is it, the church is sent. He sent them out, then he ascended into heaven, and as he was ascending, he gave them a blessing. So the blessing comes after the Ite Misa Es, in the life of Christ. We are following the life of Christ in this Mass. So they reversed it. In the modern right. And they look upon us as if, what are you doing? Uh, we're following the life of Christ, okay? It's very, very disconcerting when they question all these things that have been here from the beginning. Trying to make the Mass conform to the world and themselves rather than to conform yourself to the Mass. There are many more things that could be said here, such as the priest speaks or sings out loud seven parts of the Mass after the consecration to his communion. After the consecration to his communion, the priest speaks or sings seven times, representing the seven last words of our Lord on the cross. In any case, I hope you can see how the Mass is the recapitulation of the life of Christ. What an astonishing expression this is of our holy faith. A perfect presentation of the Lex Orandi and the Lex Credendi. This is, as far as I know from my studies, the best I've seen. Not the only one, but the best Lex Orandi available. Is it not Cain jealous of Abel? What's going on right now? Because Abel has the most acceptable sacrifice. Kind of scary. Clearly, whoever wrote the recent motu proprio is in error without any qualm of saying this. He is in error on this point as a number of cardinals verify. This is a supreme, superb lex orandi of our faith. It's not the only one. But it sure is accurate. Know then, faithful of God, this is indeed the thing that is for our peace. This is not a source of division. This is a revealer of division, just as Christ was. Never blame the Mass. Never blame this old Mass for division. For it is not a source of division. It is a revealer of divisions. Come up to this Mass and you're going to find divisions in your heart. You're going to find divisions in your neighborhood. You're going to find divisions in the church. It will reveal them. Brace yourself. Don't come here unless you want me to know what's divided in your heart. Here is the visitation of Christ among us. How wonderful it really is. Let us then engage in the Mass, love the Mass, conform to the Mass. Remember where we are at Mass, a place where we fulfill the Lord's commandments, a place where our Lord is lifted up, drawing us to Himself to become like Him and not us trying to make Him become like us. A place where we can draw close to God who draws close to us. A place where we can lay down our life with the Lord, such that no power on earth can overcome our faith, our hope, and our charity. The more we conform to the Mass, the more Christian we become. The more we conform to the life of Christ in the Mass, the more Christ conquers in our life and through us the whole world. Blessed are the eyes that see the things which you see. 
For I say to you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things that you see and have not seen them, and to hear the things that you hear and have not heard them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.